You're watching Vancouver TV, where we show you what's happening in your city. We've got the latest movie reviews and access to your favorite celebs. From fashion to red carpets, live shows, and more, we cover it all, keeping you informed about your city and in the know about upcoming events. Maybe this will all make sense if I explain who I am. My name is Dr. Ellie Staple, and I'm a psychiatrist. My work concerns a particular type of delusion of grandeur. It's a growing field. I specialize in those individuals who believe they are superheroes. <laughs> Good for you. The three of you have convinced yourselves you have extraordinary gifts like something out of a comic book. David Dunn, the only person to survive that train wreck all those years ago. What do you do? I'm in security. You think you have superpowers? It's a feeling, a vision. I have to touch them. You believe you are a protector. My name is Patricia. I have no question. There are two dozen identities. I'm Mary Reynolds. Por favor, senora. We almost got you, bro. That live in that body with you. The beast is coming any minute now for you guys. But what I am questioning is your belief that you are something more than human. And yet, it is true. My bones break easily. I've had 94 breaks in my life. But you have an extraordinary IQ. This is not a cartoon. This is the real world. No way. And yet, some of us still don't die with bullets. Some of us can still bend steel. I have been waiting for the world to see that we exist. May I meet the beast? I hope for your sake that he likes you. That sounds like the bad guys teaming up. A lot of people are going to die. Don't do this. Are you ready? What do we call you, sir? First name, Mr. Last name. To win tickets to see this movie and other fun movie prize packs, visit www.vancouvertelevision.ca. Oh, hey guys. Sorry, I was just appreciating this beautiful art here at the studio in Eastside Vancouver. And don't worry, you can too. So the Eastside Culture Crawl is here again for the four-day festival of visual art design and crafts. It's going to be an intricate uh, exhibition where you can go and visit the local artists behind the art. Um, there's everything from textile, woodwork, clothing, uh, painting, sculpture, glass blowing, you name it. So make sure you go to culturecrawl.ca and you can navigate uh, your way around the culture crawl. Make sure you have comfortable shoes and an umbrella and uh, stick with me. I'm going to be talking to a few of the exhibitors here at the festival and uh, getting a little bit more close and personal at their studios, talking to them about their art. So I'm really excited. Stay tuned. We've got a great show planned for you. So guys, I have the pleasure of taking a few moments from the very busy executive director of the East Side Culture Crawl Society. Her name is Esther. Hi Esther, how are you doing? I'm good, Pega. How are you? Great to have you here. It's um, really a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm so glad that I got a chance to come and navigate the crawl and meet you and uh, to meet these lovely artists. So uh, this is the 22nd annual Eastside Culture Crawl. 
It's, it's hard to believe it's been 22 years, but yes, it is. And we're really excited. We have, uh, once again, 500 plus artists who are participating uh, in 70 different buildings around the east side of uh, Vancouver. Wow, that's amazing. And so, I mean, how long have you been doing this for? Well, I'm one of the founding members of the Eastside Culture Crawl, but in my position as executive director, it's been my, this is my sixth year. Six years. Yes. And uh, I mean, you look happy about that. So congratulations. Thank you. I, I am happy about it because it's now started. So I'm really pleased. It's a lot of work leading up to this event and the opening. And I'm just thrilled to be here tonight. Awesome. I'm thrilled that you can be here. And you go throughout the crawl and kind of check up on each artist and, and make sure everybody has what they need and things like that, right? Yes, I do. And also, it's a great opportunity to visit the artist studios because every year the artists are producing new work. And so I'm constantly amazed and surprised at the creativity that exists in this city and particularly in this part of the city. And so, um, Esther, the, the Eastside uh, Culture Call Society has been getting involved with doing some charity work. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we are a nonprofit society. So as a nonprofit society, we are we are also a charity and we do a, no a number of different initiatives. One that we're extremely proud of, um, which is called Studio 101. And so we work with uh, four of the local area inner city schools mm -hmm. and we provide workshops for the students in those schools. So it provides the students in those schools an opportunity to come out to the artist studios and actually, you know, create a little piece of art of their own. So for many of them it's their first foray um, into the art world and certainly they're for a lot of them their first time that they stepped into an artist studio which you know as you can see from here it's a, always an interesting world it is it is and to see the different types of intricate design and and you know a lot of these artists you know whether it's inspired by music or textile or woodwork um, it's there's so many varieties of different types of um, artistic expression here in Vancouver we are so rich with that and it's so nice that we can kind of have this opportunity to get a little bit more close and personal uh, with the artists they're opening up their studio to the public you can bring your whole family. Um, does it get kind of hectic sometimes for these artists? <laughs> I think it does, absolutely. Um, I think it's a really, really a unique experience for the public to engage directly with the artists and to, you know, ask them questions about the art making process and what it is that they're doing, um, what infuses their, um, what informs their work. And um, I think it's a really uh, valuable exchange for both the artists and the public to participate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you are an artist yourself. You are a, a brilliant photographer. So please tell us about, a little bit about your own art. Well, I, I'll just say that I'm a, I'm a photo-based artist, and I'll just leave it at that. She's so humble. I saw some of her exhibits there in her studio, and they are absolutely beautiful. I really recommend everyone to make time. Um, it's four days for this uh, festival. You know, all you need is an umbrella, some comfortable shoes. Um, you need to get your family and friends together, and you navigate your way through the crawl. If you go on online, culturecrawl.ca, you can go ahead and check out the different artists' studios and kind of plan your day around it, right? That's correct. We also have an app that's downloadable on iTunes and the Android store. So that will help steer you as well. So you can use your mobile devices to get around. We have a paper program and we have a very an, an incredible website. So there's there's no reason to, to come around and not be informed about what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And this is also a society that's open to donations. So to help to support this, you know, I mean this, this is something that is is, I think unique um, to the West Coast. We really love art, and as uh, you know, as a, a community, we like to you know in involve each other in that experience of art and design. So to help make that possible, we need each other's help and cooperation. So, what are some of the ways our viewers can find out about you know making sure this is available in the future? 
Well, I think I think the public just needs to come down and, and participate and walk around this area. Uh, we go down over to Columbia, to the north, down to the waterfront, to the south, over to First Avenue, and to the east, all the way up to Victoria Drive. So do come down. There's 70 different buildings, 500 artists, um, all kinds of mediums, photography, painting, as you're going to see, you know, woodwork, uh, sculptural pieces, glass blowing, uh, uh, clothing design, textiles, every single medium is being represented at this particular event. Wonderful. So it's one of its kind then, Esther. It is. And the work that the artists are producing is one of a kind. That's what you're going to find here is very unique, one of a kind art pieces. Wow. We're pretty, we, we're pretty lucky here in Vancouver, aren't we? We are. <laughs> well, at the moment we are, and we hope that, that, that it remains that way. But of course, affordability is impacting on artist production space in the same way that it's impacting on, on, on housing. So we are, we are at, a, at, at, at a risk, and we are at a critical point, and hopefully we will find some solutions to this and ensure that, that artists have, have places that they can produce their artwork. That's right, and so that's the kind of support we need for these re resources to be continue to be available to artists, especially because they're opening up their studio, their you know, uh, not just their art, but their studio, their space where they work to the public. Um, I think that that is really kind of uh, a compassionate gesture. Of course, you know, art is all about that diversity and sharing of culture, but. To have that type of resource um, in the future, we do need each other's support. So that's, you're right. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Of course. No, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, taking time to, you know, sit with me or sorry, stand with me, I should say. <laughs> we didn't want to sit. We're too excited, right? Yes, we are. <laughs> I am because I'm excited to move on and go and visit some of the studios and see firsthand what the artists have been making all year round. I'm excited too. I won't take up any more of her time. So thank you, Esther. And uh, if you guys want to know more about this, uh, you make sure you go to the website, culturecrawl.ca. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hey guys, so I have the pleasure of sitting down with Martin Borden, and he is one of the exhibitors here at the East Side Culture Crawl, and I've caught him here in his element. Hi Martin, how's it going? Good, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. So Martin, how long have you been participating in the East Side Culture Crawl? Um, I've done it at different times. So uh, in this stint, I've done it uh, the last three years. But I was also in the crawl as a painter probably 15 years ago. So I returned. Lucky for us. So, and you are passionate about woodwork. You carve uh, wooden spoons. But that's not all that you're about, is it? Tell our viewers about, you know, all your other passions as well. Uh, well, I spent a lot of my career as a painter and I've more recently gone into filmmaking, so for the last 10 years or so, and I make short films about the arts, but particularly about environmental issues. And I'm really interested in artists that actually deal with those two things together, using art as a way of informing about the environment and maybe changing the way people live their lives and the, and the impact they have on the earth. So spoon carving kind of works in with that because these are very low impact um, objects. I carve them from wood that comes from street trees that have been removed by the city. They're mostly cherry, so they come from the flowering cherry trees. Um, I carve them by hand. I don't use any power tools. They're just with an ax and with a knife, no sandpaper, uh, mineral oil as a finish. And the idea of them is that something you could live with. You could have one of these for uh, many years. You could actually have one last a lifetime if you take care of it. So I funnel the profits I make from this back into filmmaking. So this is actually going to buy my next camera. How inspiring. And to do that through your passions, that's, that's uh, I mean, that's wonderful. So, so Martin, you have been passionate about woodwork since you were a young boy. How did, that, how did you get that inspiration uh, you know, at that age to, to start working with wood? I grew up in a family that made everything, and, and they were kind of pioneer types, so everybody carved in my family. Uh, 
we grew our own food, we did a lot of things like that. So it was the norm for me. Now I see it as being fairly unusual for someone growing up in the suburbs of Vancouver, but at the time it seemed the norm. So I, I, I carved from, I got carving books when I was a little boy and carved penguins and things like that. And then I learned this more recently, and this is based on a kind of a Scandinavian design. And um, it's really about carving the things that are of use around you. So they're not so much decorative, they're items of usefulness. Oh, that comes from your environmentalist uh, mentality, doesn't it? Like you, you. I, I read that also about you that you know you use wood that has been either scrapped or uh, pruned, or you know that has kind of been um, you know there's not really much use for it anymore. So you use recycled wood. It's it's wood that. Try to recycle it. Is what I mean. Uh, yeah, it's not exactly recycling, but it's wood that would otherwise be thrown away or burned and, and the city is very good about that when they cut a tree down because of its age or because it's been damaged they allow artists or anyone to take the wood away so yeah no trees are being harvested particularly for this this is actually just making it use of something that's already there but what else do you do with wood uh, I carve bowls too uh, they're very slow so I don't sell them in the culture crawl because they're not done on a, on a lathe they're actually carved with a knife and, and with a uh, small chisel so they're they're very slow I can show you can you show me the tools that you use to carve with so um, a lot of these are carved with a bent knife that's the inside carving so a knife that's shaped like this I have a couple of different shapes of them these are made by a, a First Nations carver that sells the blades and they carve the inside of both the bo uh, bowls of the spoon and then these large bowls and the outside is just using a very simple knife. So a little knife like that. What's the easiest word to, to carve? Like what's the most more giving one that you can kind of manipulate more? Is it cherry uh, or? Oh no, not at all. No, when people start, they usually use a wood called basswood. And it's very, very soft. It's got no character to it at all. And, uh, but it's quite easy to carve. Uh, this is on the hardness scale, this is up there. It's not the hardest by any means, but it's pretty hard. And so it, it holds a really nice um, edge to it. Now these haven't been sanded at all. I don't really like sandpaper. So this is the way we used to do things before sandpaper. It's called a knife finish. So if you look at it closely, it's all these little facets right. that the knife leaves behind. And they're less likely um, if they hit water to uh, flake apart. So if you think about the wooden spoons that you buy in a store, they've been made on a machine and they've been sanded very heavily and they're usually cheap wood too. So they get wet a few times and they get all they fuzzy. To, yeah, yeah. yeah, they start to disintegrate actually. Exactly. And as an environmentalist, you know, you recognize that is because you're expected to buy a new one every six months or every year. So if you put a little more time into how you make things and materials and um, so a little bit of maintenance on them, they will last a lifetime. It would be quite easy to keep one of these spoons maintained, as long as you don't put it in the dishwasher or um, hot water. You should never put wood into the dishwasher. One of the things that makes this uh, different than just selling something in a shop is you actually get to meet people. They come here, they always ask questions. They, you know, some people maybe have done a little bit of carving in, in their past. So I have everything set up here and I will walk them through all the processes for making a spoon. So they know a little bit about it because I think, um, I mean, spoons aren't intimidating, but sometimes art can be intimidating for people and they don't know where to start to talk about it. So if you actually show them, this is how a studio works. This is what you do. This is the space that's involved. I think it also tells people that we need to support artists because yeah, Hollywood's probably doing okay, but the local artists down the street might be struggling because uh, studio spaces are very expensive. I'm lucky that I have one in my living space, but I'd never be able to afford to have one outside of this building. Hey guys, I'm here with another exhibitor of the East Side Culture Crawl. I'm here with Warren Murphy. Hi Warren. Hi. How are you? I'm, I'm doing very well, thanks. Good. I'm the rain. In spite of the rain. In spite of the rain, yes. You know what? I think we've just all gotten really used to this rain. Yeah. They always have the art crawl during the rainy season. Mm -hmm. 
just to cheer us up a little bit with uh, you know all of this uh, inspiring uh, works of and masters and masterpieces of you local artists here I think it kind of adds to the uh, mystique of the crawl you know you're outside in the rain and you walk in, a, in an artist studio and it's all beautiful and warm and uh, full of their artwork it's pretty special I think Yes, just like your studio, I walked in and I <gasps> had to gasp because, I mean, it's impressive and it, you know, there, it looks like there's a lot of history here. How long have you been working out of the studio for? I've been in this studio at least 28 years, I think. It's, it's a long time. This is like my brain. It, my brain is right here. This is your lab. <laughs> this is my lab, yeah. I spend more time here than anywhere else. It's crazy, but that's, that's the way it is. And uh, so you have been uh, creating uh, acoustic guitars for many years. Um, you've, it's kind of been coined that you're addicted to this. So it sounds like a, a great addiction to have. Well, it's a good addiction, I suppose, if you like to be addicted, but it's not a financial uh, addiction. It's, it's, not, it's not a lucrative business. It could be a lucrative business, I think. But, you know, it's, it's fun. <clears throat> it's a lot easier now than when I started out. It does get easier. And it was fueled by your passion and uh, your inspiration for music. Yeah, I sort of started from the musician, a musician's point. I went to Emily Carr and studied sculpture back in the day, and so I learned how to build. And then, uh, you know, I sort of built it from my, my uh, interest in music and my ability to woodwork. And I, I kind of blended those two together and crazily enough decided to make guitars. That's what artists do. They kind of put all of their different, art, you know, intricate artistic uh, uh, flavors together and mix it in a pot and then something crazy comes out. And it's always just it's always just something so beautiful and inspiring. So, uh, you know. Your passion for woodwork and art. Warren, tell me a little bit about what it takes to create an acoustic guitar. I mean, what is the formula? Is there a specific type of uh, formula for each model? Oh, that's, that's a difficult question. Well, there, there are, I, I build several different models and each model has a different uh, specification. So I, there's a different form that I have to follow. And, uh, Basically, they're all built the same, but there's a different shape. So uh, the, the, the interesting thing about the models and the, and the difference in the guitar is the way the wood is blended together and the difference in woods that I, that I choose to build a guitar out of okay. to get us. So can you tell me a little bit about the, uh, the two new models that you're exhibiting in the, this crawl? Well, I've sort of got my... My black model, my, my I, I'm not going to call it Johnny Cash, but it's sort of, you know, people have coined that kind of dark guitar, you know, kind of Johnny Cash. But uh, I've, got, I've got this new Paul Pagat special, which uh, a friend of mine is a guitar player in town. His name's Paul Pagat, obviously, and uh, we designed a gu guitar together, and that's it. So I've, I've uh, got new color on it, which is black, and uh, I have probably in the last year developed the... Uh, uh, Telecaster, we call it the uh, fur caster. It's made out of reclaimed Douglas fir wood, um, which is basically sourced from around Vancouver. So it's old wood. It's made out of uh, um, rosewood and uh, indigenous wood. And um, those are my two new models. I have a traditional dreadnought and uh, a parlor guitar which is uh, kind of a standard. And I would like to hear, I mean, maybe you could sample a little bit of the sound of each of these guitars um, in a bit. We'll, we'll get to that. But also, I'd, I'd like you to tell me about your, you know, your music background, too. So you write and record country music. Wow. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I play in a band. Yes, we, uh, I've got maybe three albums of Country, country uh, tunes that we've written. A little bit of bluegrass, bluegrass and country. Oh, I think our viewers would love to hear that. And then that's that's a great way to get a sample of you as a as a country artist and your your art here, your guitars. What do you say? <laughs> I think. <yeah. laughs> 
All right. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I'm a little bit gone, got a long way to go. It's a little too fast. I'm a little bit slow. Hey guys, I've had such an amazing time tonight doing the East Side Culture Crawl. Make sure that you go to www.culturecrawl.ca to learn more about how to navigate this amazing festival and meet the local artists behind all the beautiful artwork that you can go and exhibit. Uh, just make sure you're prepared and remember to take an umbrella with you because it's usually during rainy season. You know me, I'm your host, Pega Ahani. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook. We'll see you next time on Vancouver Television.